This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by David Barnes, London, July 2006. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Chapter 48 The Flight of Sykes Of all bad deeds that, under cover of the darkness, had been committed within wide London's bounds since night hung over it, that was the worst. Of all the horrors that rose with an ill scent upon the morning air, that was the foulest and most cruel. The sun, the bright sun, that brings back not light alone, but new life and hope and freshness to man, burst upon the crowded city in clear and radiant glory. Through costly coloured glass and paper-mended window, through cathedral dome and rotten crevice, it shed its equal ray. It lighted up the room where the murdered woman lay. It did. He tried to shut it out, but it would stream in. If the sight had been a ghastly one in the dull morning, what was it now in all that brilliant light? He had not moved. He had been afraid to stir. There had been a moan and motion of the hand, and with terror added to rage he had struck and struck again. Once he threw a rug over it, but it was worse to fancy the eyes and imagine them moving towards him than to see them glaring upward as if watching the reflection of the pool of gore that quivered and danced in the sunlight on the ceiling. He had plucked it off again. And there was the body, mere flesh and blood, no more, but such flesh and so much blood. He struck a light, kindled a fire, and thrust the club into it. There was hair upon the end, which blazed and shrunk into a light cinder, and, caught by the air, whirled up the chimney, even that frightened him, sturdy as he was, but he held the weapon till it broke, and then piled it on the coals to burn away and smolder into ashes. He washed himself and scrubbed his clothes. There were spots that would not be removed, but he cut the pieces out and burnt them. How those stains were dispersed about the room! The very feet of the dog were bloody. All this time he had never once turned his back upon the corpse. No, not for a moment. Such preparations completed, he moved backward towards the door, dragging the dog with him, lest he should soil his feet anew and carry out new evidence of the crime into the streets. He shut the door softly, locked it, took the key, and left the house. He crossed over and glanced up at the window to be sure that nothing was visible from the outside. There was the curtain still drawn which she would have opened to admit the light she never saw again. It lay nearly under there. He knew that. God, how the sun poured down upon the very spot! The glance was instantaneous. It was a relief to have got free of the room. He whistled on the dog and walked rapidly away. He went through Islington, strode up the hill at Highgate, on which stands the stone in honour of Whittington, turned down to Highgate Hill, unsteady of purpose and uncertain where to go, struck off to the right again almost as soon as he began to descend it, and taking the footpath across the fields, skirted Cane Wood, and so came on Hampstead Heath. 
Traversing the hollow by the vale of heath, he mounted the opposite bank, and crossing the road which joins the villages of Hampstead and Highgate, made along the remaining portion of the heath to the fields at North End, in one of which he laid himself down under a hedge and slept. Soon he was up again and away, not far into the country, but back towards London by the high road, then back again, then over another part of the same ground as he already traversed, then wandering up and down in fields, and lying on ditches brinks to rest, and starting up to make for some other spot, and do the same, and ramble on again. Where could he go, that was near and not too public, to get some meat and drink? Hendon, that was a good place, not far off, and out of most people's way. Thither he directed his steps, running sometimes, and sometimes with a strange perversity, loitering at a snail's pace, or stopping altogether, and idly breaking the hedges with a stick. But when he got there, all the people he met, the very children at the doors, seemed to view him with suspicion, Back he turned again, without the courage to purchase bit or drop, though he had tasted no food for many hours, and once more he lingered on the heath, uncertain where to go. He wandered over miles and miles of ground, and still came back to the old place. Morning and noon had passed, and the day was on the wane, and still he rambled to and fro, and up and down, and round and round, and still lingered about the same spot. At last he got away, and shaped his course for Hatfield. It was nine o'clock at night, when the man, quite tired out, and the dog, limping and lame from the unaccustomed exercise, turned down the hill by the church of the quiet village, and plodding along the little street, crept into a small public house, whose scanty light had guided them to the spot. There was a fire in the tap-room, and some country labourers were drinking before it. They made room for the stranger, but he sat down in the furthest corner, and ate and drank alone, or rather with his dog, to whom he cast a morsel of food from time to time. The conversation of the men assembled here turned upon the neighbouring land and farmers, and when those topics were exhausted, upon the age of some old man who had been buried on the previous Sunday, the young men present considering him very old, and the old men present declaring him to have been quite young. Not older, one white-haired grandfather said, than he was, with ten or fifteen years of life in him at least, if he had taken care, if he had taken care. There was nothing to attract attention or excite alarm in this. The robber, after paying his reckoning, sat silent and unnoticed in his corner, and had almost dropped asleep when he was half wakened by the noisy entrance of a newcomer. This was an antic fellow, half peddler and half mountebank who travelled about the country on foot to vend hones, strops, razors, washballs, harness-paste, medicine for dogs and horses, cheap perfumery, cosmetics and such like wares, which he carried in a case slung on his back. His entrance was the signal for various homely jokes with the countrymen, which slackened not until he had made his supper and opened his box of treasures, when he ingeniously contrived to unite business with amusement. "'And what be that stoof? Good to eat, Harry?' asked a grinning countryman, pointing to some composition cakes in one corner. "'This,' said the fellow, producing one, 
This is the infallible and invaluable composition for removing all sorts of stain, rust, dirt, mildew, spick, speck, spot or spatter, from silk, satin, linen, cambric, cloth, crepe, stuff, carpet, merino, muslin, bombazine or woollen stuff. White stains, fruit stains, beer stains, water stains, paint stains, pitch stains, any stains, all come out at one rub with the infallible and invaluable composition. If a lady stains her honour, she has only need to swallow one cake, and she's cured at once, for it's poison. If a gentleman wants to prove this, he has only need to bolt one little square, and he has put it beyond question for it's quite as satisfactory as a pistol bullet, and a great deal nastier in the flavour, consequently the more credit in taking it. One penny a square, with all these virtues, one penny a square. There were two buyers directly, and more of the listeners plainly hesitated. The vendor observing this increased in loquacity. "'It's all bought up as fast as it can be made,' said the fellow, there are fourteen water-mills, six steam-engines, and a galvanic battery, always a working upon it, and they can't make it fast enough, though the men work so hard that they die off, and the widows is pensioned directly with twenty pound a year for each of the children, and a premium of fifty for twins. One penny a square, two halfpence is all the same, and four farthings is received with joy. A penny a square, wine stains, fruit stains, beer stains, water stains, paint stains, pitch stains, mud stains, blood stains. Here is a stain upon the hat of a gentleman in company that I'll take clean out before he can order me a pint of ale. Ah! cried Sykes, starting up. Give that back. I'll take it clean out, sir, replied the man, winking to the company, before you can come across the room to get it. "'Gentlemen all, observe the dark stain upon this gentleman's hat, "'no wider than a shilling, but thicker than a half-crown. "'Whether it is a wine-stain, fruit-stain, beer-stain, water-stain, "'paint-stain, pitch-stain, mud-stain, or blood-stain.' "'The man got no further, for Sykes, with a hideous imprecation, "'overthrew the table, and tearing the hat from him, burst out of the house.' With the same perversity of feeling and irresolution that had fastened upon him, despite himself, all day, the murderer, finding that he was not followed, and that they most probably considered him some drunken, sullen fellow, turned back up the town, and getting out of the glare of the lamps of a stage-coach that was standing in the street, was walking past when he recognised the mail from London, and saw that it was standing at the little post-office. He almost knew what was to come, but he crossed over and listened. The guard was standing at the door, waiting for the letter-bag. A man, dressed like a gamekeeper, came up at the moment, and he handed him a basket which lay ready on the pavement. "'That's for your people,' said the guard. "'Now look alive in there, will you?' "'Damn that ere bag! It warn't ready night afore last. This won't do, you know.' "'Anything new up in town, Ben?' asked the gamekeeper, drawing back to the window-shutters the better to admire the horses. "'No, nothing that I knows on,' replied the man, pulling on his gloves. "'Corn's up a little. I hear talk of a murder, too, down Spitalfield's way, but I don't reckon much upon it.' "'Oh, that's quite true.' said a gentleman inside, who was looking out of the window, and a dreadful murder it was. "'Was it, sir?' rejoined the guard, touching his hat. "'Man or woman, pray, sir?' "'A woman,' replied the gentleman. "'It is supposed—' "'Now, Ben,' replied the coachman impatiently. "'Damn that ere bag,' said the guard. "'Are you gone to sleep in there?' "'Come in,' cried the office-keeper, running out. "'Coming!' growled the guard. "'Ah, and so's the young ooman of property that's going to take a fancy to me. But I don't know when. Here, give old. All right!' The horn sounded a few cheerful notes, and the coach was gone. 
Sykes remained standing in the street, apparently unmoved by what he just heard, and agitated by no stronger feeling than a doubt where to go. At length he went back again, and took the road which leads from Hatfield to St. Albans. He went on doggedly, but as he left the town behind him, and plunged into the solitude and darkness of the road, he felt a dread and awe creeping upon him, which shook him to the core. Every object before him, substance or shadow, still or moving, took the semblance of some fearful thing. And these fears were nothing compared to the sense that haunted him of that morning's ghastly figure following at his heels. He could trace its shadow in the gloom, supply the smallest item of the outline, and note how stiff and solemn it seemed to stalk along. He could hear its garments rustling in the leaves, and every breath of wind came laden with that last low cry. If he stopped, it did the same. If he ran, it followed, not running too. That would have been a relief, but like a corpse endowed with the mere machinery of life and borne on one slow melancholy wind that never rose or fell. At times he turned with desperate determination, resolved to beat this phantom off, though it should look him dead. But the hair rose on his head, and his blood stood still, for it had turned with him and was behind him then. He had kept it before him that morning, but it was behind now, always. He leaned his back against a bank, and felt that it stood above him, visibly out against the cold night sky. He threw himself upon the road, on his back upon the road. At his head it stood, silent, erect and still, a living gravestone with its epitaph in blood. Let no man talk of murderers escaping justice, and hint that providence must sleep. There were twenty score of violent deaths in one long minute of that agony of fear. There was a shed in a field he passed that offered shelter for the night. Before the door were three tall poplar trees which made it very dark within, and the wind moaned through them with a dismal wail. He could not walk on till daylight came again and here he stretched himself close to the wall to undergo new torture. For now a vision came before him as constant and more terrible than that from which he had escaped. Those widely staring eyes, so lustreless and so glassy, that he had better borne to see them than think upon them, appeared in the midst of the darkness light in themselves, but giving light to nothing. There were but two, but they were everywhere. If he shut out the sight, there came the room with every well-known object, some indeed that he would have forgotten if he had gone over its contents from memory, each in its accustomed place. The body was in its place, and its eyes were as he saw them when he stole away. He got up and rushed into the field without. The figure was behind him. He re-entered the shed and shrunk down once more. The eyes were there before he had laid himself along. And here he remained in such terror as none but he can know trembling in every limb, and the cold sweat starting from every pore, when suddenly there arose upon the night wind the noise of distant shouting and the roar of voices mingled in alarm and wonder. Any sound of men in that lonely place, even though it conveyed a real cause of alarm, was something to him. He regained his strength and energy at the prospect of personal danger, and, springing to his feet, rushed into the open air. 
the broad sky seemed on fire, rising into the air with showers of sparks and rolling one above the other were sheets of flame, lighting the atmosphere for miles around and driving clouds of smoke in the direction where he stood. The shouts grew louder as new voices swelled the roar, and he could hear the cry of fire mingled with the ringing of an alarm bell, the fall of heavy bodies, and the crackling of flames as they twined around some new obstacle and shot aloft as though refreshed by food. The noise increased as he looked. There were people there, men and women, light, bustle, it was like new life to him. He darted onward, straight, headlong, dashing through briar and brake, and leaping gate and fence as madly as his dog, who careered with loud and sounding bark before him. He came upon the spot. There were half-dressed figures tearing to and fro, some endeavouring to drag the frightened horses from the stables, others driving the cattle from the yard and outhouses, and others coming laden from the burning pile amidst a shower of falling sparks and the tumbling down of red-hot beams. The apertures where doors and windows stood an hour ago disclosed a mass of raging fire. Walls rocked and crumbled into the burning well. The molten lead and iron poured down, white-hot upon the ground. Women and children shrieked, and men encouraged each other with noisy shouts and cheers. The clanking of the engine pumps, and the spurting and hissing of the water as it fell upon the blazing wood, added to the tremendous roar. He shouted too, till he was hoarse, and flying from memory and himself, plunged into the thickest of the throng. Hither and thither he dived that night, now working at the pumps, and now hurrying through the smoke and flame, but never ceasing to engage himself wherever noise and men were thickest. Up and down the ladders, upon the roofs of buildings, over floors that quaked and trembled with his weight, under the lee of falling bricks and stones, in every part of that great fire was he, but he bore a charmed life, and had neither scratch nor bruise, nor weariness nor thought, till morning dawned again, and only smoke and blackened ruins remained. This mad excitement over, there returned with tenfold force the dreadful consciousness of his crime. He looked suspiciously about him, for the men were conversing in groups, and he feared to be the subject of their talk. The dog obeyed the significant beck of his finger, and they drew off stealthily together. He passed near an engine, where some men were seated, and they called to him to share in their refreshment. He took some bread and meat, and as he drank a draught of beer, heard the firemen, who were from London, talking about the murder. "'He's gone to Birmingham, they say,' said one, "'but they'll have him yet, for the scouts are out, and by tomorrow night there'll be a cry all through the country.' He hurried off, and walked till he almost dropped upon the ground, then lay down in a lane, and had a long but broken and uneasy sleep. He wandered on again, irresolute and undecided, and oppressed with the fear of another solitary night. Suddenly he took the desperate resolution to go back to London. There's somebody to speak to there at all event, he thought. A good hiding place, too. They'll never expect to nab me there, after this country scent. Why can't I lie by for a week or so, and forcing Blunt from Fagin get abroad to France. Damn, I'll risk it. He acted upon this impulse without delay, and choosing the least frequented roads began his journey back, resolved to lie concealed within a short distance of the metropolis, and, entering it at dusk by a circuitous route, 
to proceed straight to that part of it which he had fixed on for his destination. The dog, though, if any description of him were out, it would not be forgotten that the dog was missing and had probably gone with him. This might lead to his apprehension as he passed along the streets. He resolved to drown him and walked on, looking about for a pond, picking up a heavy stone and tying it to his handkerchief as he went. The animal looked up into his master's face while these preparations were making. Whether his instinct apprehended something of their purpose, or the robber's sidelong look at him was sterner than ordinary, he skulked a little farther in the rear than usual, and cowered as he came more slowly along. When his master halted at the brink of a pool, and looked round to call him, he stopped outright. "'Do you hear me call? Come here!' cried Sykes. The animal came up from the very force of habit, but as Sykes stooped to attach the handkerchief to his throat, he uttered a low growl and started back. "'Come back!' said the robber. The dog wagged his tail, but moved not. Sykes made a running noose, and called him again. The dog advanced, retreated, paused an instant, and scoured away at his hardest speed. The man whistled again and again, and sat down and waited in the expectation that he would return. But no dog appeared, and at length he resumed his journey. End of chapter 48